at the break, um, a number of people uh, came up and, and talked to me and they uh, said, well, you're doing a great job. And um, quite frankly, I always do a great job. And so <laughs> that's not news to me. And um, I gave a seminar in Chicago some months ago and I had food poisoning. I came down with food poisoning the night before and I was up virtually all night sick. And uh, we, um, I went ahead and we did the seminar. Uh, I always perform, whether, unless I'm dead, uh, then I won't perform. And um, I was perspiring from the food poisoning and I was wearing a suit similar to this and the water and the body had soaked through my vest, my waistcoat as they say in the United Kingdom and I, I just was just, and everybody thought I was just fired up because I was talking. And um, the, uh, finally my fever broke in about the fifth or sixth hour and that was a, that was a, a marathon. That went from uh, 8.30 in the morning till four in the morning. And then once my fever broke, I felt so good and I knew I wasn't going to die because I would have paid somebody the first five hours to just put me to sleep. And, uh, and I just got fired up and then uh, afterwards um, they were asking me uh, during the question and answer period if uh, I always got that fired up. And I said, no, only when I have uh, had been poisoned by some shrimp or something I had the night before. But um, See, it's the attitude. I know I'm always good on, on, in front of a group, whether it's five or 5,000. And I know I'm always good in presentations, financial presentations with people. Um, and um, it's, it's not an attitude, and it's, but it's a, uh, it's a way of life. Successful people are successful at virtually everything they do. Some are, are so one-sided about it is that they won't do anything they're not good at. And I'm not quite that far yet, or I probably never will be, because I did play tennis a long time and I wasn't a fantastic tennis player. Uh, I did have my serve clocked at 127 miles an hour and uh, you, you, you didn't try to return my serve, you tried to get out of the way. And, um, but the, it's, it's, it's more than a mindset, it transcends that. Um, it's, it's, it's a way of life. Everything I do and everything that high performance, super high performance people do, their whole life evolves around that, that high performance idea. And um, the expectations that we have of ourselves are very high. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, I have very high expectations for my children. And um, the, um, virtually, in, in most, virtually everybody's mind, way too high expectations. But my theory is that even if they only accomplish 20 or 30 percent of my expectations, they're going to be a heck of a lot better than anybody else. Uh, I tell the story of my son, first year of Little League. Uh, this is a couple years ago. My, my children were raised for a number of years in the United Kingdom. And they learned to play cricket where they went to school. Uh, their school was founded in 1269 by the Benedictine monks and they, they, when we moved to Texas they wanted to know why everybody was so excited about the Alamo from 1835. You know, I mean why does everybody think this is a historic event or a historic site? 1835, our house dad was born, uh, made in 1468, the castle. And so, but they decided they wanted to play baseball so when we went home for Christmas, two Christmases ago, I bought baseball gloves, bats, and all this stuff, and uh, I measured out. Now, I didn't know a Little League diamond was smaller. I didn't know, you know, the, um, the measurements were different than for professional baseball. So I got a book on baseball, and I, we measured out a diamond uh, out on the front lawn between the lock, which is the lake, and the castle. And we were out there during uh, Christmas practicing. And when we first started practicing, I, I, I didn't understand why my kids, who were pro both pretty strong, couldn't get the ball from center field to the pitcher's mound, which was, you know, 200 and some feet. And, I, uh, I, and so by, by the time we left to go back to the United States in early January, they had, a, they, they, they had to get a running start like a javelin thrower, but they could get, they could get it over second base. They had to bounce it to the pitcher. Well, when they went for baseball practice in February, 
they looked like Brooks Robinson. For those of you that are old enough to remember Brooks Robinson with the Baltimore Orioles, he was like a vacuum cleaner. He could pick up the ball. And so they, they went through practice and they both got on teams. And what I forgot to teach them was fly balls. Because I never played baseball. I taught them batting and all these things. But they didn't do very well to fly balls. They'd overrun the ball and all this. So I told Derek that a thousand was perfect in baseball. That means you hit it every time you're up. Even sometimes, Derek, you got you to gotta get on the base, even if you got to step into the ball and let it hit you. Now, Derek batted 640 his first year. 640. When he played catcher, he was the only kid that blocked at the plate. I said, you come at him like a fullback when you got the ball as catcher, Derek. He was the only guy that could throw him out at base. Stealing from first to second. The next year, his expectations were different because he found out from his friends that's twice as good as anybody else batted. He batted 278. Because he listened to other people. Garbage in, garbage out. He went from an all-star catcher. His team won the league. Player of the year to a damn doofus batting 278 with my blood in his veins. <laughs> now he's just a regular doofus player. Doesn't practice, smokes and jokes, you know. He's become the Nintendo King or something of uh, Palace Verdes. So I'm not as successful with my children as I'd like to be. But, um, but that's, you know, that's a perfect example of the expectations we put on ourselves. You know, I say all the time, whatever your, your, your expectations vis-a-vis -vis your goals, multiply them by 10 or add three or four, five zeros. But our consciousness tells us and our subconscious tells us, what if we're wrong? What if we fail? What will people think? And that's what we're going to learn to overcome. And again, you'll be so empowered when you talk to someone, and not in a rude way, and not care what they think. You have no idea. It's, it's beyond your wildest imagination. And by the way, a few people have come up and told me about my, my scarf. I hate to tell you guys or girls, that's how you're supposed to wear the scarf. You know, that, that, that's just another idea of, 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 of the, another example of the doofus mentality. This is the way you're supposed to wear it. <laughs> huh? Style, I mean, Europe, they've been wearing scarves like this since the 1500s in Europe. You wear them out, you don't wear them tucked in so you just see a little neat little corner. Another example. You know how you can tell if a, a, a man or a woman is wearing a tailor-made suit in Europe or around the world, except for in America, because they're all doofuses. Do you know, have any idea? The last button, because in a tailor-made suit, the buttons are normally, you can actually unbutton these buttons. The last button is unbuttoned, and the button is underneath, not, bless you, not on top. Yet, American suits are made just the opposite. There's a lot of garbage you've been taking in all your life. I mean, and the, um, and I'm not here to, to, to clothe you, other than I can tell you first, <laughs> that you only have one time to make a first impression. And I mean, uh, just like Candace Sloan when she sits down, if the guy's not hot, she's adiosville. And... There are things and deals that you look at that you know instantaneously, or at least you should. And by the end of today, hopefully you'll be farther along on that end, of, further along, excuse me, at that end of the continuum. Does the audience know the difference between further and farther? Farther is distance. Okay, F-A is distance. He hit the ball farther. I'm going, I'm going to go further with you today that's what I used to, uh, I used to tell the girls in high school. We're going to go further tonight. 
That's F-U. That's F-U. It is. Further. I just thought of that. I didn't realize that. I, I just made a joke and I didn't even know it. Yeah, I like that. Chicken, chickens lay eggs, I lie down. You know, I'll get into that, but anyway. But it's interesting, when I, when I, when I talk to people, I listen how they talk. You know, like, uh, I listen to their vocabulary. And I'm not particularly well educated. I went to a state university, Cal State Northridge here, and I went to UCLA Graduate School. I mean, those aren't particularly big, didn't go to Harvard for sure. I mean, uh, they, those aren't particularly strong names in the world today. But one of the things that I, I've told my young uh, friends that have gone to great schools is nobody's ever asked me where I went to school in my whole life. Doesn't matter. Okay, now, we're going to go through, I need my glasses for this. Could you hand me my... That's right. Um, that print's a little too small. It's only two inches high. <laughs> These, this is what we're going to cover today. These are, I didn't know that what I kn know is, or, or would be considered secrets until I started in this business. Because this is just common sense to anybody that's been super successful. But we call them secrets now just so, because that's what you come to a seminar to get. Secrets are revealed. <laughs> There's nothing secret about this. They've been, doing, they've been doing this since man first came onto the earth. Okay, how to fade conventional wisdom and make a quantum amount of money. Why success is not for everybody. The consequence of a misguided decision in the cosmos of time is nothing. None of the decisions you make are life-threatening. There are no brain surgeons or heart surgeons in this room, I don't believe. Yet, were you going to raise your hand? Are you? Oh, well, I was going to say, okay. Now, yet we, we, we labor over the decisions we make like they were life-threatening. In the cosmos of time, these things that you, anything that you've done in your life is not a fart in the wind. In the cosmos of time, no decision anybody in this room has ever made is worth spit. Myself included. Yet we labor and pound and grind because we're afraid of we're going to be wrong. We're afraid of what somebody else thinks. The reason I can make decisions like this, I used to do a deal, I don't do it anymore. I go around and in, uh, you tell me in 60 seconds, your biggest challenge, problem, revelation, and in 90 seconds to 120 seconds, I'll tell you how to solve it, whether it works or whether to can it. And, I, and with a 95% probability, I've been 95% of the time right. How can I do that? Well, what if his whole business life is, is dependent on this, Dan, and his wife won't eat and his kids... In the cosmos of time, it doesn't matter. Now, if you were only going to make one decision in your life, that's not the way to go through the decision-making process. And the point is, you shouldn't be just making one decision. You should be making a series of decisions. That's the key. Okay. Um, why learning how to forget right and wrong in decisions and instead of focusing on how to recognize and seize opportunities is the only way to achieve super growth now? Why goals don't have to be realistic? Why goals should have no time limits and how time limits really inhibit you? Why you must pay yourself first and always in a growth cycle? Why you cannot ever second guess yourself or any subordinate to achieve maximum rapid growth? Why you must take seriously the advice of those you respect, underlined, but no others, not the doofuses of the world? Why perception is reality and how to make it work for your work for quantum growth? How to make mastermind groups work. My experience has been mastermind groups normally don't work, but we're going to talk about that. How to pick a mentor and why everyone needs one. Why yesterday's dreams are today's realities. How to see dreams ahead of time now. Simulation, how and why practicing within when you're without. How and why you should act as if there are no limits to your abilities. Why enthusiasm is the God from within. I have never met in my life, I'm 49 years old, a high-performance person that wasn't enthusiastic. Just think about it. Have you ever met a high-performance person that wasn't enthusiastic? Ever? Even the doofuses that take your money at these seminars. They're pr pretty enthusiastic, aren't they? I would be too. I'm selling them crap and I'm getting paid money for it. I'd be elated. 
As they say in Texas, I would think I ain't had so much fun since the hogs ate my baby brother. <laughs> How to laser beam focus now on what you want later, why it's better if you failed a few times in order to achieve super growth. How it makes it easier. I can tell from this group, we got a lot of failure in this group, so we're going to have an easy time making it to the quantum leap because we got a lot of experience at failing. That's good. Why you should always follow the fellow that follows the dream. People want to do business with me and people like me because I dream big. You should want to do business with people that have dreams. Banks loan me money. I've raised, I raised over a billion dollars when oil went from 40 to six dollars a barrel. When you couldn't raise money in the energy business, it was impossible. There was no way you could do it. You want people to do business with you because you've got a dream and they know that you're not going to give up on it. Um, why you shouldn't waste time on things you can't change. Why you must divert. Let me stop there a minute. The day I met my in-laws, I knew <laughs> I was never going to change them. So I didn't spend the last 24 years. I've been married 21 years, but I met them 24 years ago. I did not spend 24 years trying to change them. There are people that I meet in a business relationship that I know that it's not going to work out. It's, it's, it's very analogous to, is it hot? I mean, they're, they're, they're bless you, there are, they are so much different than my, the way I do business that, I mean, I don't waste time on it. Here in this audience, we have people around the world, not just this audience, that waste an inordinate amount of time on things you can't change. It's like the old adage, a man or a woman with a significant other, well, I'll change him after we get married. That's a load of crap if there ever was one. I mean, that's, you're not going to change, so, so, you know, so, I say, if it looks like a frog, jumps like a frog, it's got warts, and it lives on a lily, uh, um, pad, lily pad, it's a frog. It's not going to be a stallion or a lion or a computer. I mean, but yet we spend all this time, and you can, you, if you can't tell by now, I don't waste a microsecond on anything I can't change. I make an instant evaluation and either I go for it or I forget it. Period. She's either hot or she's not. And she's walking up this aisle with no clothes on. She looks hot to me, so I think we're going to go with this deal. You know? She walks in with a, and I, we have a religious person in, in the audience, and I don't mean to offend anybody. She walks in wearing a habit like, you know, old-time Catholic nun, you know, and that's how simple it is. She's either hot or she's not. Yet we beat Lotus 1, 2, 3, these things together, to death, I mean. And we got a lot of computer nerds in the audience. I can just tell, I can smell you. Um, why you must avert avoidable mistakes and let your successes run to achieve hypergrowth why you cannot dwell on past failures, why you must focus on, the future, on future successes, why it is not how far you've come, it's how far you've got to go. It would be extremely easy for me to sit back at the castle in the library and pat myself on the ass and, and, and dwell upon what I've accomplished in my life. It would be easy. Most of you in this room would be there patting yourself on the ass sitting up in the library of my, of my home. That's why the question that's often asked, why do you do this, Dan? Why do you, why do you want to talk to these doofuses? Because I'm impassioned about it. It gripes me that people take your money that don't know spit. It gripes the hell out of me. It's criminal. They might as well come with a mask and a gun to take your money, damn it. It's criminal. They have no more right to do that than I to coach Eric Hyden in ice skating. In fact, I got more right to coach Eric Hyden than they do to have to take your money. 
So it's not what you've done, and uh, many of you in this room have accomplished a lot. It's not what you've done, it's what you're going to do down the road that's important. Extremely important. Okay, why only mismanagement causes business failures? It's not interest rates, it's not the market went against this, it's not competition, it's your failures, my failures, that close businesses down, ladies and gentlemen. All the rest is crap. People go out of business because they mismanaged. Six or seven or eight thousand energy companies went out of business for in the 80s and early 90s. Great Western Resources was the fastest growing energy company in the world from 1980, uh, I think, four through 1991. Why you can never underestimate how wrong you can be. Why you must plan for success, no backups, fail safes, or parachutes. Whenever anybody comes to me and says, I've got plan A and plan B, well, I say, what the hell's plan B for? Well, that's if we don't make it. You won't. Next. <laughs> don't ever come to me with plan B. I'm not interested in plan B. You better have double A plan. Don't ever go to a financial institution with two plans. Forget it. I mean, you're wasting your time. There's plan AA. Well, what are you going to do? Well, we haven't planned for failure. It's like the question that's now famous that I was interviewed by the Financial Times, which arguably is the best financial newspaper in the world. It's published out of London. Um, well, why is it that you, uh, uh, the energy recession hasn't affected you, Mr. Pena? And I said, um, my colleagues and I decided not to participate in the energy re recession. <laughs> we didn't. It's like when I sold real estate here in San Diego in the early 70s during a big recession. I didn't know what recession meant when I was going to college. So, so I just sold the hell out of it. It didn't make any difference to me. I had a 94.6 close ratio. You either bought from me or you died. <laughs> that was it. You had two choices. The hearse pulled around or you bought. I, because as my son thought a thousand, the guy that trained me, a guy named Paul Schiffman, and a guy named, I um, can't remember the guy's name now, Stewie Fox and one other guy, they said, um, we expect you to close everybody that you talk to. And the incentive in the pay scale was aimed that way. <laughs> That's what I did. That's what I did. I didn't think about, you know, anything else. I was focused. See, I was fo in those days, I was really focused. I used to sleep in my office. You know why high-performance people have showers in their office, ladies and gentlemen? Because they sleep there. Either that or they're having sex with a secretary or something, but I slept there. I now know why. I'm not going to ask how many people have showers at their office here. I can just tell by looking around the room. Okay. Um, why you can never... Oh, excuse me, why you must plan for, oh no, excuse me again. Why the more you investigate, the less you'll have to invest. A cute story. Uh, when we were raising money for one of our private placements in the uh, late 80s, there was a gentleman uh, that we approached in London who, uh, Mackey and Brown, or Brown and Mackey, they were the second largest bridge builders in the world. And uh, I, we made this presentation to him, and he said that uh, he was going to have to check with his partner and he'd get back to us. We never heard back from him. A year later, I'm at the Hilton in London, sitting up in the main dining room upstairs, and I see him um, at the bar, and I ask him to join us, and we're having dinner, and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Brown, you know, I always wondered you were going to get back to us about what Mr. Mackey had to say. And he said, um, well, that was just my British way of saying no. Mr. Mackey died over Dunkirk in 1943. <laughs> and... Uh, I said, um, and I'm not taken back by what people say too often, but I was fairly stunned at that time. 
And I said, say again, I mean, he died in 43? And he said, yes. And I, and I said, uh, oh. And he said, you'll, you'll learn, Mr. Pena, that the more you investigate, the less you have to invest. Another famous person, he's not so famous, but very well, well, well to do guy, Costa Grazos, uh, the CEO of uh, NASA Shipping Line, who was one of my mentors, told me essentially the same thing. Uh, the more you investigate, the, the less you'll have to invest. Most people in this room invest in all the wrong things. Most people in life invest in all the wrong things. And uh, I have a due diligence process that I go through that is actually, I, I think, in one of the books around here, uh, that the red flags, like one of them, just for an example. If I, in checking your CV or your resume, we find one error, one single solitary error, there's no chance of you ever doing business with Dan Pena. Like, I graduated on the dean's list from college, which is different than graduating with honors. Right? Yes, it is. And I'm very careful about that because I once was quoted uh, in a newspaper uh, wrongly to say that I graduated with honors. I didn't. I graduated on the dean's list. Um, small thing, but important. Uh, you better have gone to the schools, you tell me. You better have gotten a degree and not just walk on campus. You know, I've been to, I went to Oxford too, you know. I stayed there one afternoon for lunch. I mean, very important. And uh, it's like if I play golf with you and you cheat, no way I'll do business. You better remember every stroke that you took. Because these are things that indicate character. And what you don't want is to be in business with people that have a lack thereof. I also have the doofus test. We're going to have a meeting. I'll make sure you fight traffic both ways. On your anniversary, on your birthday, on whatever is important day to you. I don't want, ever want to hear, well, I'd like, can we make that two hours earlier so I don't have to fight traffic? Thank you very much. Have a good life. The Mosby brothers are two fellows I just hired to run one of my companies. I call them the Doofus brothers. They're from St. Louis. They're blonde. They're what Hitler was talking about in the Aryan race. These guys are blonde, blue-eyed. They look like they came out of GQ magazine. Everything's perfect about them. Handsome. Um, um, they went to um, TC, Texas Christian University, undergraduate, and I forget where they went to graduate school. Doesn't matter, that's why I forget. Uh, and um, I had a meeting, a board meeting at the castle last August, and I told them we wanted them there from the 14th to the 17th. And I could see John Mosby look a little apprehensive. He says, I'll be there. And I said, well, what's the problem? He says, well, I'm getting married on the 19th. I said, so? Now, I don't remember, it's been a long time since I was married, but there are a lot of stuff you do before you get married, if I remember correctly. He was there. He and his brother now co-manage that company. If he hadn't been there, and I didn't pick it, just that happened to be an accident. I didn't pick that day because I knew it was, he was getting married in a few days after that. It was just by accident. But was I happy when he said, I'll be there? I mean, it warmed the cockles of my heart which at this juncture some of you might think is black, but it's not really. <laughs> it warmed the cockles of my heart that that kid said yes. Made me happy beyond, you can't imagine how happy, because I know the deal's going to be a runner now. Because I've got two young men that are going to, they're going to make it successful or die. So I have, I have the doofus test. Ed has been through the doofus test a number of times. Because I, I reinstitute the doofus test every once in a while just to get everybody's attention. I have a, a business partner that I wrote a letter to not too long ago um, that uh, I thought it was important that we brought in a new partner into the deal so we get things done faster. And uh, this, this is a guy that's never been early to a meeting since I've known him. He was 20 or 15, 20 minutes early to the meeting. We got paperwork out of him like crazy. 
for a few weeks because the implication, and even though I didn't say it, the implication is that if we brought in a new person to do what he was doing, one of two things were going to happen. Either he wasn't going to be there anymore or the equity that he owns in the company was going to be reduced and cut in half. You know, got two lawyers, you know, cut his percentage in half. And I'm not as ruthless about it as a lot of the high performance people. I mean, there's only one woman on the Fortune 500 that's a, a CEO, and she's a real nut buster. I mean, she makes me look like an angel. But you know, it's interesting, there's only one woman, a Fortune 500 CEO, and I think that's criminal. There was only one woman 25 years ago. Her name was, um, um, God, I can't think of it now. She was president and uh, CEO of uh, Singer Sewing Machine. I can't think of it now. But um, most of the high performance people have doofus tests. Doofus tests. They want to see what your level of commitment is. Normally, the level of commitment is next to, to nothing. It's extremely important that you gauge in, you know, how people are going to react. And especially, if your level of commitment is high when things are going good, then your level of commitment is going to be super high when things start going bad. If your level of commitment is only lukewarm when things are good, it's going to fall in with a tidy bowl man when things start getting bad. And all business relationships have ups and downs, just like all marriages and you know female male relationships female female male male whatever they all have ups and downs if, and, and business is no different okay how to sell your obsession to your others to others employees bankers etc for quantum growth how pride of authorship can destine you to failure how less control not more control is mandatory for quantum growth why you must never reassess personal stroke professional lives in terms of your own how to get rid of people with no hooks how to acquire an instant track record of, of deals if why if you're not prepared to die you're not prepared to live why you are never ready for quantum growth you're never ready some of the, I've heard people say I've honed my craft for 10 or 20 years uh, and I say and I'm ready now to make the quantum leap or ready to, to take the next step. You're never ready. You're only comfortable. And I use the analogy, Kirk Gibson, when he hit the home run for the Dodgers in the 88 World Series. Bottom of the ninth, two outs, three guys on. They were behind five to three or something. And he had been hurt. Uh, seriously hurt. His, all his groin muscle and thigh was all ripped to shreds. The cartilage in his knee was all banged up. And he comes out, they well, sort of little calls him over and he comes he comes dragging his leg out like this. Who's the guy that does the announcing for the Dodgers? Vince Scully. Big choke in his throat. And he says, it's the bottom of the night. He swings and misses. He swings twice. And then he hits a grand slam. He was interviewed after that, and he's been interviewed many times after that. Were you ready to be put in that possession? He says, you're never ready. And ladies and gentlemen, you're never ready. You, what you are is, as he said, I was comfortable with my ability. To hit it out of the park. I knew I could. I knew I didn't have to run the bases. We think too much about running the bases before we ever hit the damn ball. It's not running the bases that gets it done, ladies and gentlemen. We can always get a pinch hitter to run the bases. As Babe Ruth did. His last home run, I believe, he had a kid run the bases for him. We spent our whole lives, our whole careers, worrying about running the bases and instead of taking a damn swing at the plate. It's not, you are not ever going to be ready. What you'll be, hopefully, at the end of today, is you'll be more comfortable with your own resources. Because you all have the resources to do it. 
How many of you started your business in your home? I asked this yesterday. So did I. So did Jobs for Apple. So did Hewlett and Packard in their garage, not in their home. No different. Now Jobs happens to be pretty smart. I don't think he went to college or he dropped out or I don't think he graduated. Just think about that. I mean, it's the comfort. It's being comfortable. Okay. But when you do catch him doing something right, then give him unlimited earned praise. Because people know when you're blowing smoke and not blowing smoke. Find him doing something right and then praise the heck out of him. I've only learned that the last several years. I mean, uh, last few years before, I didn't really, I didn't really understand that concept. Um, I wasn't a beer, big theory X, theory Y, theory Z proponent, which we're going to talk a little bit about uh, later today. Um, and why revenue, not cost control, is mandatory for quantum growth. I said it yesterday, and I'm going to pound it to death. You can always find somebody to do your cost control. If you've got no damn revenue, you won't be in business. Revenue is the single most important thing an entrepreneur can do, can do. and you can never, it like, it's like I used to think, you can never have too much sex, you can never have too much revenue. I know now, no, you can't have too much sex. Of course, I'm 49 years old now. You can never have too much revenue, never. Because with revenue, you can borrow money. I mean, it gives you ultimate leverage. And contrary to what you've been told earlier, marketing isn't the ultimate leverage. Other people, getting people to do other, you don't get paid for what you can do. You, can, you will ultimately get paid as a high performance person for what you can get others to do. It's people and other people's money that are ultimate leverage, and we're gonna talk a lot about that. And uh, why you need the best advisors, I call them moles, and I'm gonna talk about that. Smart, but not too smart because you can't do it alone. What high performance individuals do and why you see so many transactions done by the same groups over and over is once you get a, a high performance team together, it's like um, a carnivorous animal. You gotta feed it something. You gotta, you've gotta continue to work it. And my advice is to hire and utilize the best advisors you can afford. I use the best I couldn't afford. I hired O'Melva D. and Myers, Warren Christopher's firm, uh, when I didn't have two nickels to rub together. I used Coopers and Libran. I audited my books. My advice to people is always run your business as if you were going to go public. Then you don't ever have any problems. Most of you that have private companies are milking it, living off of it. Probably uh, some of you don't pay withholding tax. You pe call people contract employees when they're not. I know all the tricks. I've been there. I've done that. Nobody knows how to milk ride a company to death better than I. But in the long run, and you're going to hear me say, never make short-term solutions to long-term problems. In the long run, if you want to be a high-performing person, that's not what you do. Because short-term solutions to long-term problems never work. It's like the old adage, it's like putting a, a Band-Aid on a cancer sore. And as I already said, man becomes what he thinks about most of the time. I think about business. I thought about Great Western. When we talk about goal setting a little later on, um, I'll, I'll really define this a lot better. But when I, when, I, when I saw Great Western, and this was when I had $800, I saw that we were going to come up an elevator, the offices, and the elevator would open, and it would just be Great Western, and it'd be Italian marble on the floor as you got out of the elevator and then you'd look down uh, at the reception desk and it'd be mahogany, all mahogany wa uh, walls and it'd be a giant gold GW this high and a big picture of me. Well if you go to 1111 Bagby in Houston, Texas today and you go up on the 17th floor and those big elevators open and you see the Italian marble, and you look down there, they used to have a drop-dead gorgeous uh, a receptionist. She's married now. She married uh, up, thank God for her. And a big, huge gold GW, 
Of course, my picture's not there anymore. But that's all I thought about. And then we have 40, the company has 44,000 square feet of office space there. That's our corporate headquarters. But I lived it, I ate it, I breathed it. For those 10 years, I didn't play golf. 10 years, I didn't play. It consumed me. Because you become what you think about most. Before I bought Guthrie Castle, my wife and I talked about how we were going to have a grand estate and, and we have tennis courts and all the various things that the, the, um, the compound has. Can we cut these lights down? Oh. Well, okay. We thought about it and how we were going to raise our kids there and how we didn't think about the wall garden because that's the view from the wall garden down towards the main house. We didn't, I didn't know the wall, the wall garden just was there. So, I mean, but we didn't think about that. But it's virtually what we, what we dreamt about and what kept me going those 10 years. Now, Ed, keep that one out. Wrong way. That's how I dreamt and thought of myself. That's how I looked to myself. That's a famous painting now. That Howard was painted by Howard Morgan and it's made him famous now. Hasn't done bad for me either. Yeah, see the handkerchief? I mean, huh? Well, I don't have the boots. I gave a seminar dressed like that once at the castle. Driller, my great Dane, and the only thing that's, this is uh, 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 like a, a Ray, uh, Rayburn, who's a famous uh, uh, European painter. Uh, the ears of that great Dane have been clipped. In, in the UK, you can't clip ears, so that's the only, and great Dane was my dog. He, uh, he posed for that. We used to flew him down to London and he posed, he sat for that picture. I wasn't there when he sat for it. But uh, this is, and this is how I want you after today to think about yourself. It won't be a castle and it won't be you dressed like this, but it'll be something. And I think about it daily. I still think about it. I have other dreams now. I think about it daily, every single day. And I'm not going to get into affirmations and all that stuff, but I believe in all that. I think about it, and what you think about most, you'll ultimately become. And if you go back and talk to Gates and Jobs and all these guys, they've thought about these things since they were in college or since they were in high school. Some of them since they were, you know, um, like the guy that just won the U.S. Amateur, Tiger Woods, the, uh, the black kid, uh, who great, probably going to be the greatest golfer, at least he has the potential. By the way, man's biggest burden is potential because almost always it's unfulfilled. It's your biggest burden. Man's biggest burden is potential. But Tiger Woods, since he was three years old, thought about when in the United States, uh, what do you call it, amateur, since he's three. And then they, they've asked Tiger, who's I think 17 or 18 years old, they said, well, aren't you worried that all the pressure and all the expectations that the world has for you and, and he, gave the, oh, he gave such a classic answer, which made, makes me believe that he is going to fulfill his potential. He says, the world's expectations are de minimis compared to the expectations I have for myself. I mean, I got goosebumps. And there's a lot of big expectations. They're talking about him being the next Jack Nicholas, but they've talked about a lot of people being the next Jack Nicholas, and none of them have they've all fallen by the wayside. But that kid, with that kind of answer. Now, when you think about it, yeah. See, this is where I come from. That's not a joke. That's for real. That's my family. That's my grandfather. That's my grandmother. If he looks like he rode with Pancho Villa, he did. My grandfather was a rapist, murderer, and bank robber. He got thrown out of Palermo, Italy. I'm one quarter Sicilian. He's, he was Italian. He was all Sicilian. And when the mafia throws you out of Palermo, 
and then you, you, you come to Mexico and you team up with Pancho Villa. I met him once in, in, in the late, uh, or actually early 50s before he passed away. Next. I mean, and that's when my grandmother, the little child in that, that lady's lap is my father. So I, I mean, I'm just regular folk. In fact, I'm less than. I'm a minority folk, according to, you know, the government does things for me. They've never done anything for me, but, you know, I can get special dispensation because I'm a, just a poor minority. Maybe I'll go borrow some money from the government. I'll go back to the, um, here, no, you're right. Okay. This is where I lived in East Los Angeles. They put a fence around it now because they used to stack dead bodies in it. That empty lot is where I lived in East L.A. They have a chain link fence. And now I want to show you what Quantum Leap is. From that chain link fence to that. That's what we're talking about today, ladies and gentlemen. It's possible. That happened in my lifetime. Okay, Ed. And it can happen for you as well. Now, yep, yeah, lights. Without total commitment, without being laser beam focused, you have little or no chance to achieve what we're going to discuss. I've talked about don't wasting time on, uh, on things you can't change and to concentrate on your future successes. God knows we all hopefully have dreams and to concentrate daily on those. To achieve, this is a pennyism, to achieve hyper growth you must avert avoidable mistakes and let your successes run their course. I want to spend a couple of moments on that. Avoidable, mis av avoidable uh, uh, mistakes. What's avoidable? Okay. Now remember I, I told you that up to today, there's no reason you should have guilt for the mistakes that you made in business. After today, and um, there is a, uh, a, a rabbi in the audience, uh, you better have big time Jewish guilt <laughs> because you're going to know better. Bless you. You're going to know better. And um, avoidable mistakes now are going to listen to people, an example, that don't really have any business giving you advice. Avoidable mistakes are uh, knowingly doing business with a, a convicted felon. There's no excuse for that. Unless you're a masochist, and if you're a masochist, I know some people into that stuff, I can, I can turn you on another way. I mean. You don't have to go and spend your money doing that. We'll get you a whip for free. Avoidable mistakes for me are, I know historically that people that are dishonest and lack integrity aren't potentially good business partners. And see, I use private investigators, and like Ross Perot said, and everybody got mad at him when he was running for president, Every major corporation, every minor corporation, uh, or no, I won't say minor, every corporation in the Fortune 1000 has been using private investigators since time began to find out about their competition, to find out about whether they should be, you know, go, uh, go in business bed with somebody. And um, it's part of life. So I know a lot more about people before I go into, into business with them. Um, and it's not there to use like J. Edgar Hoover did when he was the head of the FBI. But it's to be careful because the more you investigate, if I, let's just say everybody in this room had a business deal that we could do together. I, I, would, I would bet you my net worth against anybody's net worth in this room, even the smallest, that probably two to five in the room would pass the mustard test. We'd never get around to the second round of negotiations. And that's not because anybody's dishonest in the room or anything else. It's just the criteria that I set up is pretty high. So the more I investigate, the less I have to invest. That's not counting the people that have done a lot of things that probably you, you don't brag about at the country club or when you're out to dinner. Um, and I've got some of those, you know. I've been arrested three or four times. Uh, not for fraud or anything like that, for assault with a deadly weapon, uh, let me see, uh, assault and battery, drunk driving, I forget what the other, oh, buying liquor as a minor, 
Um, so I, I wasn't, I, you know, you can go back, uh, it was so many years ago, most of that, uh, after 20 years or so, they, I forget what you tell them, they take it off the computer, <laughs> yes, they purge it, they purged it, so, uh, and so, uh, but I tell people about that, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's, like I tell the kids when I was in East LA after the riots and I was working with Rebuild LA, and I go into the high schools, and they, I drive up in my Rolls Royce, and the uh, superintendent school says, Dan, you don't want to bring that car to campus. I said, nobody's going to touch my car. Don't worry about it. And so they, they have security guards every 100 or 200 feet on, on high school campuses now. And I asked, what the hell do you got security guards here for? He says, you'll see. Just hang around a while. <laughs> and sure as hell, a fight broke out between two girls about after there were about 20 minutes. I had never seen girls fight before. God, was it ugly. I mean, r really ruthless. I mean, it was unbelievable. And so I get, we're in the football stadium, and there's about 2,500 kids in the stadium, and I'm standing down on the track. Uh, with the principal and, uh, and, and with uh, the, the youngest mayor in the United States, uh, Fidel Vargas, who's one of my uh, disciples, one of my protégés, and he became mayor. We got out of Harvard, ran for mayor when he was 23, uh, became mayor. He's now also a deputy mayor for uh, Mayor Reardon, and, uh, and uh, he makes a speech to the kids, and the kids are real rowdy, screaming and yelling, and I get up and, and I tell the students to shut the F up silence like this and the football coaches are up in the stadium and I said can't you belt a couple of these kids around and keep them quiet so we used to be able to do that Mr. Pena we can't anymore kids have rights now I said okay so I start talking to the students and they obviously didn't relate to Fidel Mayor Vargas being he's a goody two-shoes he always did everything right got straight A's you know was on maybe all conference this and that and you know student body president and these kids couldn't relate to that at all and I stood up and I said how many of you been arrested at least once, 80% of the student body raised their hand. How many have been arrested twice? And the superintendent of schools behind me saying, why does Mr. Pena still have his hand up? How many have been arrested three times? How many have been arrested four times? And I still got my hand up. And I said, the point, kids, is this. I'm not proud of the times that I've been thrown in jail when I was a young kid. But at some point in your life, you've got to get your head screwed on straight. You can either do it now or you can do it later. It's easier to do it now. And I instantly had rapport with the children because I've been there. Just as I've been where you want to be or someplace on that continuum on the way, along the way to where I got to or am still proceeding. And I can't relate to you or I, I don't think anybody that ever talked to the kids had been able to relate to them more than I did. Just as I don't think you've ever heard of anybody from a business point of view, you may not like what I hear and what you hear and but I can tell you it's the truth and it happened that way you know I see some frowns and some looks of disbelief in the audience you may not like it but as I said earlier absence of evidence just because you haven't experienced it or you don't know anybody that's experienced it please believe me it's happening as we speak as I speak and you sit and listen it is happening in corporate America small America from a single proprietorship all the way up to the biggest corporations in this country the fundamentals the successful ones the fundamentals that I'm going to been talking about and gonna continue to put forth to you are happening and have happened f since time began because most of what I say is common sense I mean Napoleon Hill wrote about a 50 60 years ago 40, yeah, 50 60 years ago Avoidable mistakes, you know what they are, and let your successes run. I've given this analogy many times, but it's very important. When I was in the oil business and I had a refinery, we made $14 a barrel margin on 50,000 barrels a day. Now, that's a lot of money every day. I, w I took that money and I went in the movie business instead of building another refinery. Now, it looks pretty clear to me in 1994 and since, since 1990, I should have built a lot more refineries pretty clear to me. It wasn't clear at the time though, because I didn't. <laughs> now that was an avoidable mistake. I lost all the 20 plus million dollars I put in the movie business. I did the first country west, or I did a country western with Hoyt Axton and Dolly Parton. I did the first Pet House Pet of the Year Awards with Bob Guccione. That was a lot of fun. Didn't make any money. I did a movie with um, Richard Harris, Martin Landau, and Karen Black called The Last Word. It was significant, you know, there was a euphemism in there someplace because it was, it was my last gasp in the movie business. That was an avoidable mistake, but I, I made it. I should have known better, but I didn't. 
Come tomorrow, come this evening, you're going to know better about a lot of things. You're going to be able to go back and just as they asked the panel yesterday, the biggest marketing mistake that the panel made, I mean, what's the, the top three biggest mistakes that you've made in your business careers? Uh, and some are probably already coming to light as I speak. You've already thought about them. Now we're going to talk about growth. And to me, as I've already said, there's only one kind of growth. And it's the growth that I think down deep inside, if you had your druthers, you'd all like your businesses or careers to take that growth pattern. And it's, it's, and we're going to talk about it so you understand it very well. So we lay a better foundation for what we're going to talk about the rest of the day. To me, growth is the only thing you should be worried about. It's obviously, well maybe it's not so obvious, the process of growing and developing. We grow as individuals. You know, I know more now at 49 than I did at 35, although I thought I was pretty smart at 35, but I know, and I knew more at 35 than I did at 25, and I thought I was plenty smart at 25. Um, I bought my first Rolls Royce when I was 25. Um, I still remember taking it to the 49 cent car wash. Back then you could have a car wash for 49 cents and then breaking the antenna off of it. And I'm, I'm going to choke the, uh, the guy there and, and my wife was saying, uh, who was then my girlfriend, says, Dan, we shouldn't have come to a 49 cent car wash. Now that was an avoidable mistake. <laughs> I should have known better. But I didn't. You know, and then on top of it, they scratched the hell. I didn't know the difference between hand washing and the machines in those days. They scratched the sides of my silver rolls rice up. But, um, so, it's, it's, it's a process of developing. I'm a better coach today than I was five or ten years ago. I'm more experienced. I have, I've made a lot more decisions. So I'm in a better place to help people. Someone here uh, who saw me speak a year ago or a year and a half ago said, uh, um, I think they, she used the word calcifications. I got all my calcifications out or some word like that. And um, I don't know about that. But I probably am a better speaker. I'm a better speaker every time I speak, because I speak a lot. And in business, you get better at it by doing it. You get better at transactions by doing transactions. You get better at making decisions by making decisions. Not by, you don't get better at it by thinking about making decisions. There's a big, big difference. Now, someone from the audience, how, how do you perceive a business can grow? Pardon? Duplication. Duplication. Make sales. Pardon? Acquisitions. I've been accused, by the way, my, the, by the other uh, purported gurus in the business, that really I'm an acquisition guy. I don't know anything else. True. It's a true story. Um, that's, couldn't, I don't know if it's, the, if it's the furthest from the truth, but... It's, it's, it's pretty far-fetched because I'm really not. Uh, I'm a guy that will help you grow your business whether the fastest way, whether it's acquisition, internally, or internally. That's what I know how to do. That's what I've been very successful at doing. So, some of you, it's going to be by acquisition. Some of you, it's going to be internally. Some of you... You're in the wrong business. Um, and I'll tell you, I've told businesses to turn the key. I remember giving a talk in Los Angeles to a bunch of CEOs, and before the talk started, they were talking about the guy had lost 60% of the net worth of the company in the last three years that it took him 30 years to build. Okay. Now, you don't have to be a Harvard MBA to figure out that you ought to turn the key there <laughs> and close down the place. And then when we pursued that with him, he said, I don't have the heart. And he says, this is, I'm a fifth generation owner. He's only talking about the net worth he had built up over the 30 years he was running it. And um, there was a time to close the, the doors on the steel industry in this country when we weren't competitive. Okay, for a lot of reasons that aren't so obvious, perhaps we didn't. And now we're competitive. You know, 
$25 billion investment later and 20 years later. Um, but so some of the businesses that you're in or some of the businesses that you're contemplating, you shouldn't go into. And I won't be afraid, as you probably already guessed, to tell you that's a doofus idea. And that also doesn't mean that I want, don't want you to ask me because you're afraid of what the other people in the audience are going to think. You're going to afraid of what your significant other is going to think. Here Dan's going to say I'm a doofus moron in front of all these people. Better I call you a doofus moron, and I won't be that impolite. Better I call you a doofus moron, and you don't waste a bunch of years and a bunch of money. And that's really what more the other seminars and the other things we do are into, where we actually walk through people through. Since I, we have one kind of growth is exponential growth. That's increasing at a rapid rate. When you started your businesses, for those of you that are in business, when you go from ground zero to $10,000 a year or $10,000 a month, you're growing exponentially by definition because you're starting from zero. The passion that you had when you started your business, that's the passion I've maintained over a business career. It's not easy to maintain that passion. It's like maintaining the passion for your significant other. It wanes. That's life. That's how, why the porno film industry has gotten going, because of waning significant other relationships. That's why there's a pornographic industry. That's why there's the 800 hotlines or the, the whatever those things are. But if you had the same passion when you started the business, where you were willing to do anything, you worked seven days a week, leverage your house, leverage your car, miss your anniversary, etc., etc., your business wouldn't be where it is today. It'd be significantly closer to the quantum end of the continuum. But we get complacent. We have geometric growth, progression with a constant ratio between successive quantities for the mathematicians. Do you have any mathematicians in the audience? Good. <laughs> One, three, nine, twenty-seven, eighty-one. And we have arithmetic exponential, geometric, and quantum. I had a physicist, PhD, explain to me how this is really not quite accurate. <laughs> See, but that's not the point. I mean, believe me, that's not the point. Arithmetic, we're all the same numbers. Five plus five equals 10. Five times five equals 25. Five plus five squared equals 30. Five squared plus five squared equals 50. And five squared times five squared equals 625. Most of you are at 5 plus 5 because you're looking at it, gee, I've grown 100%. That's arithmetic growth. I'm down at the 5 squared times 5 squared. All the same numbers. And quantum increase with marginal effort. That's the important thing. Marginal effort. I'm going to give you an example in, in, in a number of the... Gurus use this example, so I don't like using it, but I, it's the best one that I've thought of, and I can't think of any better. The difference between a 250 batter um, and a 350 batter is one time at bat. A 350 batter gets five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve million dollars a year. A 250 batter gets two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. That's a marginal increase in effort. One bat per ten. Doesn't sound like a big deal. Yeah, look at the difference in economic value between a 250 and a 350 batter. What we're going to talk about is only marginally changing the way you do business. In, uh, back in the 1800s, uh, when they were trying to scale the Matterhorn, they had tried unsuccessfully for 50, 70, 80 years, mostly Englishmen, because Englishmen like to do things that they fail at, you know. They climbed up and they all died, and they climbed up and froze to death this time. And then one guy, one guy back in 1870 or whatever it was, decided, you know, we've tried this, we've tried this, let's do something just dynamically different, 180 degrees. And he walked around the other face of the Matterhorn, and they walked up. And you can walk to the top of the Matterhorn, walk. And in the, in the lousy physical shape that most of you are in, you could walk up. But he did a, just a complete reversal. And that's what quantum growth is all about. Doing a complete reversal of what you're doing now. 
they walked up and all those, just think about all those families that thought about their loved ones dying there, freezing their butt off on the Matterhorn. Another, another example is we've all seen flies fly against the window. And they fly against the window until they beat their brains out. I can see a lot of flies, a lot of black and blue foreheads just beating their head against the, the, the window pane, right? And then they die on the sill, right? And then there's an open door 20 feet away or an open window right above them. How many have seen that? I don't want to ask anymore. How many of you are those flies? I see a lot of black and blue foreheads out there. A complete reversal of thinking. That's what we're going to instill or empower you with today. It's the antithesis. It's the... Uh, there's another fancy word for antithesis. I can't. No, that's not a fancy word. You can tell where he went to school. <laughs> uh, no, I can't think of it. But the, um, it's that simple. Because what we're going to do is have a suddenly, highly significant advance and breakthrough. That's what we're talking about. All these empowerment guys talk about a breakthrough. None of them ever made one. But they all talk about it. Well, we're going to show you how to do it. Now, physicists studying quantum mechanics note that particles make these jumps without apparent effort and without, a, without covering all the bases between the starting and ending point. In the long jump, when the long jumper, any long jumpers from high school or college? Okay, when you hit the board, you got your mark, you go down the runway and you hit the board, the only thing you're thinking about is your 25-foot mark, your 30-foot mark, whatever it is. You're not thinking about all the gyrations in between. What you've done is you've spent a whole lifetime thinking about the mark between where your foot hit and 30 feet. When John F. Kennedy was um, inaugurated in 1960 on that cold morning, him wearing his morning coat and with the steam coming out of his mouth, and he said, in this decade, we will put a man on the moon safely, return him safely before the Russians. Does anybody remember that speech? At that time, ladies and gentlemen, there was no NASA. We didn't have a, 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 a missile that could get more than a 200-pound payload off the ground. We had nothing. That's macro thinking. All the things happened afterwards. When I set a goal for $2 billion and to be one of the highest paid executives in the, in the country, energy executives, I had a lease fax machine, a telephone, and $820 bulging out of my pocket. John, this quantum thinking isn't new, ladies and gentlemen. This is old. Christopher Columbus. I mean, I can go through... You know, Thomas Edison, Henry... Ford, I mean, I can go dozens and hundreds and thousands of people. Men and women. There was no NASA. Part of my, uh, my, 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 my deal with my kids, I both sent them to NASA camp because I want them to go to a military academy because of the discipline factor. I love doing business with former military guys. My first career, I was a career army officer. I, uh, the discipline, I mean, because discipline is a big part of being a high performance person. I mean, to stay disciplined like I am with what I've got is not easy. I mean, that kickback in the Caribbean, I mean, see, I can do that. I can buy that island. Kickback like Don Taylor is, you know, I mean. <laughs> see, you've got to stay disciplined. Because with that quantum thinking, these are the kinds of things that are possible. And these are things that I did. Get a $20 million contract with the federal government, not on any set aside, I might add or it's any minority deal, with no other employees or office space, only a phone and a lease fax machine. Achieved $50 million revenue my first year in business with one employee, me. Buy a foreign subsidiary from a Fortune 200 size company over the phone on New Year's Eve. Buy a $150 million company, U.S. company from its multi-billion dollar foreign parent when they didn't want to sell. It was a Canadian company, so it wasn't really that fair. It was me against a $10 billion Canadian company. But I like doing business with Canadians. 
turning $820 into $400 million energy company in eight years when the price of oil went from 40, actually went to six, to $10 a barrel. John Kennedy said, we're gonna put a man on the moon. The only thing he knew about flying was when you're jumping in and out of bed. Men and women have been doing this since the beginning of time. This is nothing new. Yet I can tell by the looks on your face, because this audience is no different than any of the other audiences I've been before, this is the first time in your life, unless you've heard me speak before, that you've ever heard anything closely, even remotely, like this. Garbage in, garbage out. If after today, you continue to do business the way you do it, did it before today, you deserve what you get. You're destined to be, if not a failure, pretty damn close to it. Especially since you've been given, in a, at least part of them, by the end of the day, uh, many more of them, the tools to do it differently. Jewish guilt should prevail. You should feel sick to your stomach next time you do something the same old crappy way. Because the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. Create it yourself. That's why many of you have gone into business to begin with. Now, some of the other gurus have 30 steps, 500, 700 books. I've only got five. And actually, some college students that I had a year ago almost convinced me that I could really make it three. But we got a lot of this stuff printed up in fives. So uh, we got books. Well, I mean, so it's going to stay five until we get, you know, maybe it'll be condensed down to three someday, but not until we get through a whole bunch of things. It's like I wrote a book, or that, uh, the, the pamphlet thing that's um, actually what you got, and I printed 10,000 of them before I ever spoke to anybody, before I ever knew anybody like it or not. I spent, you know, I just assumed everybody was going to like it. In fact, I had a 10,000 with an option to print like 4 million or something. <laughs> oh, God. Yes, I'm not a marketing guy, I can tell you that. Okay. Now, this is the whole crux of the business strategy versus um, um, theory that we're going to get into. This is the basis of, this is mine, the high performance guys all have their own, but this is Dan Pena's. And this is a compilation of a lot of business deals, three mentors, one of which is Jim Newman, um, and just a, a lot of experience. Okay. A lot of things that I talk about now, we did as children, but we stopped doing them. Like I, I once told Ed, I, I had this real good marketing thing that worked. He said, why did you stop doing it? I don't know. You know, and we stopped doing things that we did as children. I'll, let me skip down to practice within when we were without, simulation. When we were kids, when I asked my first girl out on a date, lucky girl that she was, I practice in front of a mirror. What is she going to say? What is she going to do? Etc. Etc. When I would ask my father for something special, which wasn't too often, because the only thing he gave me special was a, a smack in the head, the uh, I would practice. How many have ever practiced asking somebody out on a date when they were kids? A few. I did. I told you earlier I practice being successful. I, when I gave the commencement speech at Cal State Northridge a couple years ago, and I was before, in front of the kids, uh, and, and you know, they were passing these dummies back and forth, and they got vulgar words on their uh, flat hats, whatever those things are called, boards. And I saw myself there to be brought back as the most successful alumni that ever went to the business school. I, I'd seen that 10 years before, and I told the students that, and the parents. I had seen myself. I had practiced that speech in my own mind many, many times before. 
I practiced. I, when I met the President of the United States the first time, first time I was in the White House, first time I met the Queen of England, I was comfortable because I had practiced. I had seen myself doing that. I had seen myself, you know, bowing my head to Queen Elizabeth. Um, I had seen that. When I went in, when I, when I made my first presentation to a big financial institution a long time ago now, I was comfortable because I had practiced. You must, in my judgment, practice the things that you want to do. Just as you will become what you think about most, I intimidate, not knowingly, I just do, intimidate most audiences. If there, if there were 50,000 people in this room, it would be no different. I practice, I practice not to get ready. I practice because I know practice makes perfect. Yesterday's dreams are today's realities. I told you about, maybe I didn't, I, I was running down Torrance Boulevard down past Don Taylor's house, and I told my wife that I was going to buy a castle on an island. She said, sure, honey, whatever you want. We just keep trotting along. Um, and um, that was in uh, the spring of 1983. In August of 1984, I bought a castle. And as my wife would point out to me, it is on an island, Dan. Great Britain is an island, you know. The... Uh, because my wife is supportive, my significant other, and, and quite frankly, I've had marriages and relationships break up after the seminar. It's a fact of life. You can't, don't waste time on things you can't change, ladies and gentlemen. Because if you want to change it, it's because you don't like it, right? It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Okay, now, I see my dreams ahead now. I, I've already uh, told you how I, I see I see me dominating the uh, success business success coach coaching business. I also told you if Ross Perot or one of the other gentlemen I've alluded to all morning went into this business, I'd retire because unless I can be the be biggest, have been the most successful, then I don't want to do it. If Gates decides to do this, which isn't likely. I mean, I'm sayonara. <laughs> now, if all the uh, personal development or business success coaches in the country, in the world, would get out of the business that haven't been as successful as I have been, there'd be nobody in the business. If all of them got out of the business that were only 10% as successful as I've been, they'd be all out of the business. Just think about all those tapes and books you bought. Act as if there's no limits to your abilities. My Magnificent Seven, my young, you know, my young uh, kids that I'm working with in Los Angeles, which is what I call them. We'll see if they're all s magnificent. I know there's seven of them. I've counted them. <laughs> to act as if you have no limits to your abilities. As it says in the manual, in 1980-something, I sent Charlie Soliday, my partner who's since passed away uh, at age 40, um, Pay price to action. I said, Charlie, go to Citibank, go to New York, we, uh, and come back with the financing, or don't come back. Charlie, he said, uh, yes, Dan? I said, go to New York, come back with the financing, or don't come back. He went, and he, he got financing both from Solomon Brothers and Citibank, and, you know, he, he, he invented a way. He paid Citibank $250,000 just to look at the deal. No guarantees. And if they looked at it and didn't like it, the 250 was not refundable. If they did do it, it came off the fee. He paid $500,000 to Solomon Brothers to do the same. $750,000 to us at that time was more money than we had. It wasn't all the money in the world. It was more money in the world than we had in the world. But Charlie knew, because he was a former partner with Coopers and Lybron, that that would get their attention and he could he, plus he acted enthusiastic I mean he was enthusiastic he wore his clothes out from the inside I mean the guy was just a dynamo when people tell me that I you know I couldn't get them to do see when somebody doesn't agree with you or doesn't make the decision that you want them to it's not their fault it's your fault because you didn't present it correctly you didn't present it aggressively enough enthusiastically enough, 
When we were kids and we played sandlot ball, for those of you that did, and there was a kid, one kid, every group had a great athlete in it. And you're playing touch football or tackle football in the park and, and uh, the, the great athlete says, uh, you know, uh, I want you, do you think you can beat this guy in the flat? And the guy says, well, I don't know, it's 50-50, it is rainy and I could drop the ball. I know I can beat him speed, you know, my time in the 40 is this and his time in the 40 is that. And then over here you got a kid jumping up and down. I can beat this no good doofus in the flat. Just give me the ball. I can beat this no do good doofus in the flat. Majority of the time I'm going to go with the guy that's enthusiastic. Because he'll beat the doofus in the flat. As opposed to the finely tuned athlete, you know, with 2% body fat. Enthusiasm. I have closed more deals with enthusiasm than I have with brains. I assume all transactions will close. I assume everybody will, will buy. If you're not enthusiastic with the way you present things, and and it's not being braggadocious, it's not being anything, it's being in love with what you're doing, your project. And if you don't love your project or your revelation enough to put yourself on the line, then you've got the wrong project or the wrong revelation. It's that simple. And enthusiasm comes from the Greek word God within. And again, I have never, ever, ever met a high-performance person that wasn't enthusiastic. Not one single one. You just think of the high-performance people, assuming you know somebody. It's not likely you met them on the um, seminar tours, but Zig Ziglar is enthusiastic, isn't he? And I consider him one of the more successful ones. Zig's great. He's been the same for 25 years. I mean, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's a great speaker. Okay, now, for those of you who see, now normally a speaker would say, because I know last night I used this, they would apologize for using it again. I don't apologize, I don't really care, because most of you didn't get it the first time, so we're going to go over it again. <laughs> now this is an article that appeared in USA Today. Pardon? Oh, oh, turn the lights down, okay. Okay, this was an article that was published in USA Today last year, and it's about dreaming. And it says, about 1,500 readers of the newly created exec magazine answered a mail-in survey on their daydreaming habits at work. Here's what the respondents, about 90% men, most aged between 25 and 40, and almost entirely lower to middle level managers, said they do when, uh, when they let their minds wander. Do you ever uh, dream about having sex with a co-worker? 77% said yes, 23% lied, said no. <laughs> okay. If yes, how often? 52% occasionally, 22% said weekly. 24% said daily, 3% said on the hour. <laughs> Have you ever daydreamed about changing an aspect of your body of image um, to appear more impressive to coworkers? 84% said yes, 16% said no. Are you ever shocked out of a daydream and able to answer a question someone has asked you? 45% yeah, said yes, 55% said no. Do you daydream about being CEO of your company? 73% said yes, 27% said no. Do you ever fantasize about what you'll say to your boss the day you quit? 69% said yes, 31% said no, they lied as well. Do you ever dream that you have secret powers such as the ability to read minds, become invisible, or control other people's actions? 62% said yes, 38% said no. And have you had at least one daydream in the last year that you turned into reality? 71% said yes, 29% said no. If a survey indicates, and this God knows this isn't scientific, 71% of the people interviewed said that they've turned one of their daydreams into reality, why in God's name should it be so hard to believe that high performance people 
turn their dreams into reality all the time. How? Why? Why should it? The answer is it shouldn't. 71%. Now, I, if they, I was asked that question, I'd probably say 95% of my dreams have turned into reality. High performance people dream bigger, think bigger, and they, they most, most assuredly have a higher fulfillment rate of their dreams. The fulfillment of your dream is directly proportional to your desire to succeed. How badly do you want to succeed? How much are you willing to sacrifice? For if you are not prepared to die, then you're not prepared to live. Now, there was a time in my career that I would have taken a bullet for Great Western Resources. Almost did a couple of times. Um, that's not the case, even though I'm the largest single shareholder today. Most of you, I, I would hope all of you that have children, uh, would do the same. I know I would for my kids. There are days that my oldest son strains that thought. <clears throat> Like when he got arrested here a few months ago for telling the headmaster to go blank herself. But um, it's that passion that you have for something that's important to you. Unfortunately, most people that attend not just this seminar, but virtually all seminars, as I said earlier, have a pretend passion. They pretend to be interested in being successful. They pretend to be interested in being high performance. They pretend to be interested in, in having a different lifestyle. That's why the program Lives of the Rich and Famous is, was so popular. Because there's a lot of pretenders. In the seminar business, they call them wannabes. I don't have groupies that follow me around like some of the guys do. Because either, I, either you want to hear me again because you really want to be successful or you just say, boy, that was an experience. Did anybody ever attend EST back in the 60s or 70s? Well, I'm not, uh, what's that guy, Werner, what was it? Earhart. Earhart. I'm not, this isn't an S deal, but you're either going to love me or hate me. There's no question in my military or civilian mind, and from the looks on some of the faces, I got some haters out there too. But see, that's okay. Because I don't care. If I can pull out just a few crown jewels out of this group, I'm going to feel good. I'll feel good. Out of every group, I've had some, every single group, I've had some real superstars. I just, you know, I know this is a kind of a lower end quality group, but because we, we know that most of you had to give you some for the IQ test, the 100 a little while ago, but it's not hard. If it was hard, I wouldn't be here. Trust me. I mean, if, and we're going to talk about my, my, uh, my history a little later, a little more in depth. Now, let's see. We're going to take a break for lunch. See, I forget about breaks unless somebody reminds me. Um, but I only want to break for uh, 45 minutes. And so it is now 10 after 12. Is that correct? Okay, right about 10. We will, we will meet back here at... Um, yeah, make it straight 1 o'clock. I'll start talking. It's a little more than 45 minutes. Thank you.